All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, we'll just give everybody a little bit of time here to join in. We'll maybe wait a couple of minutes. I'm going to actually throw a um, quick little poll up here to see kind of what industry everybody is working in while we're waiting. I see lots of people joining, which is great. Okay, we got some votes coming in. For those of you that are just joining, we're just gonna give a couple of minutes and wait for some stragglers to come in and then we'll get started. Okay, lots of folks from 2D animation, 3D animation, lots from design today, which is interesting. We didn't have anybody from design yesterday, so that's kind of cool. I'll share these results in a second. We'll just wait for a few more votes to come in here. All right, so let me just share this. So hello everybody, my name is uh, John Annis. I'm the head of sales here at Tangent Labs. And with me is Mike DiCarlo, who is the Loop product specialist. We're really happy to have everybody with us today. As you can see uh, with the results here, we've got a really good mix of people in attendance, 2D animation, lots of 3D, some VFX, commercial, games, design, even some VR, which is really great. I'll just stop that um, right now. So thanks everybody for answering that. And thanks um, for taking the time and being here with us today. I know it's a really uh, weird global situation out there and we're, we're appreciative that everybody can join us. I'm really excited to see that there are many aspects of our industry that are thriving. Uh, so that makes me happy. Um, but this is essentially is our new normal, right? As you can see, I'm working from home. This is my luxurious uh, basement office. Mike is working from home. And I think that uh, most of you probably are as well. Actually, just as another quick little poll, let me throw this one up and just see where everybody is working from. Yesterday, I think we had 100% of people working from home. Oh, today already we're breaking the rules. We've got uh, some, some studio office, some hybrid. Let me just give this a couple more seconds to get some answers in. So I'll just stop this here and share. So you can see most people are working from home, but a few from the studio and the office and, and uh, hybrid as well, which is really cool. So, um, Today we're here to show you Loop, which is our, our brand new cloud-based production pipeline tool, which launched this week on the AWS Marketplace. We're really, really excited about this and we're happy that you, happy you could be here to join us. So you'll notice, you may have seen in some of the marketing and branding that the Loop tagline is storytelling simplified. And this is something that we feel very passionate about and that we take seriously. And the people behind the development of Loop and all the people at Tangent Labs are artists at heart. I mean, say for me, maybe on the sales side, um, we really pride ourselves on the creative and we pride ourselves as being a tool that was created for artists by artists. And so as, as you know, you experiment with Loop and as we go through development phases, we really want you to hold us to that. We wanna be a tool that is for the community. And Loop was born out of that community. It was born in our sister company, which is Tangent Animation. And like most studios and most of you who are working out there in studios or either as freelancers, we grew up in a historical production model where we were using multiple disparate tools to achieve a goal of, of understanding how the production was going and how the project was. Where were our assets? Where were we on a particular shot sequence? What is the status? What was the heat map? And, and we were using tools like F-Track and Shotgun, like uh, proprietary asset managers that probably a lot of you have been exposed to, um, review tools like CineSync and, and um, collaboration tools where you need to download software and queue up all of your review material, and probably some Excel and Google Docs as well. And I'm interested to know if this is something that resonates with you folks. So this, I promise this will be my last survey and then I'll leave you alone. But what are the tools of choice that you've used to manage, manage your uh, productions in the past? I'll just give this a few seconds here. 
I'll share these results, but I'm seeing lots of shotgun, lots of Excel and Google Docs, which, uh, which is very, very common and some homegrown stuff as well. We'll just give this a few more seconds. Okay, I'll just stop it there and I'll post this very quickly so everybody can see. So, you, you know, lots of shotgun, which is uh, very common. And as I said, Excel, Google Docs and homegrown systems. So the, I think the thing that I wanna say about all these tools is they are all really, really great applications. They're all really great at what they do. Shotgun, F-Track are excellent for project management. CineSync is a great review tool. Excel and Google Docs for business productivity are obviously really, really amazing tools. But what we find is when we're trying to manage our productions and we combine these four or five or this handful of disparate tools, it really takes the focus away from the art and more on the technology. And at Tangent Labs, what we really strive to do is keep the focus on the creative side, keep the focus on the art. And that's essentially what we're trying to achieve with Loop is a really great combination of all of those different tools that allows you to seamlessly manage your productions through the life cycle of the project and hopefully put all of the focus back on the art and back on the creative. So what we're going to do today is have Mike run you through Loop, and we're going to show you some of the fundamentals and, and the areas where we think we really add value. Uh, it'll be a combination of pre-recorded videos as well as a live demo. There is a Q&A function here, so if, if anybody wants to post questions as we go along, we'll, we'll try to answer those either in line or after in a Q&A period. Um, and I'll pass it over to Mike here, but again, just want to thank everybody for being with us today. We really appreciate it. And we're super excited about Loop. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so like John was saying, we'll, we'll go through the product. Um, we'll start with a couple of videos that just give a brief overview and introduction. It's a little bit faster to do it that way than if I, um, if I do it all, all live. Uh, but for some of the bigger functionality, um, kind of the core project management stuff and, and the asset management, component, we'll switch over and I'll, I'll, um, I'll demo that in real time. Um, well, we can answer stuff as we go. If you miss anything in the videos or something's not clear, just, just put it in the Q and A like John was saying, and we'll, we'll jump back to it. Um, so let me just, let me just get, I made you host my, so we should be able to. Okay, cool. Yep. Got it. So. Okay, you guys should be able to see this. And I'm gonna hit play. It's about 10 minutes. Um, and you know, feel free to feel free to ask questions as we go. In this video, we're gonna take a look at the loop user interface and set up a new project. Let's get started by logging in. And once we've done that, we'll be on the project's landing page. Along the top of this interface, we see the product navigation bar. This is one of the three main navigational components of Loop and contains a project switcher on the left, a link back to this page in the Loop logo, and the user menu on the right, which contains pages for my account, company, help, and logging out. Let's take a look at the my account page where we get an overview of the logged in user. We can see and edit personal information, reset our password, see the projects that we're assigned to, and see all of our recent activity. Let's switch over to the company page where we get an overview of the company configured for this loop instance. We can see a list view for all of the projects plus an activity feed. At the company level, we have settings where we can configure our own summary statuses, roles where we can configure user permissions. Loop comes with three common roles built in for admin, production, and artists. And people where we can add and disable users. Let's go ahead and add a new user to loop by clicking on the add user icon in the username header. We'll give them a unique username, enter a first name and last name, a title, pick a role, and enter an email address. We'll mark them as active and click the check mark icon in the actions field. Later, we'll add this user to a project and assign them some tasks. To edit an existing user, we click on the pencil icon in the action field. Let's jump back to the project's landing page by clicking on the loop icon in the product navigation bar. 
The project's landing page will always show a list of projects that the current user has access to, and the last entry in this list is always a link to launch the new project creation mobile. Let's go ahead and open it up. And this form asks us for some basic information about the project that we want to create. Let's start by taking a look at the templates along the left side of the modal. Loop comes with four templates built in, feature film, episodic, VFX, and minimal, which can be used as a base if you need to create your own custom templates. For this example, let's stick with feature film, which will give us a typical sequence and shot structure. You can read more about what these templates do in the descriptions just below them or in the docs. Let's give our project a name and a short code. Let's leave the create demo data box checked and let's pick the project type from the dropdown, which will tell Loop what type of files to track. We'll go ahead and click create. And we're taken to our project landing page. So now we're in the MIMO project. Uh, this is an animated feature that's halfway through production, so we have some data to look at. You can see that we still have access to our product navigation bar along the top of the interface. And we have an additional two navigation controls, the data views menu on the left and the actions menu on the right. The data views menu is a group of pages that collectively represent all of your project management data. You'll see that if we click on a data view, it'll navigate us away from the current page. We can click on the home button to return us to the landing page. Clicking on an action menu item will open a drawer without leaving our current place in the application. You'll notice on the overview tab that we have three embedded data views. These are the same and have the same functionality as their dedicated data views that we'll see in a bit. The tasks view lists all of the tasks on this project, including shots and assets. The media view lists all of the media on this project, sorted from newest to oldest. And the activity view shows all the recent activity on this project. Combined, these three views are intended to give you a quick look at the state of the project. Now let's take a look at the other four views on the home page. The settings tab, where we can set up our file system, mount descriptors, render settings, and statuses. We'll take a closer look at some of these in later videos. Moving on to the templates tab, where we can set up custom project structures for advanced use cases and task templates to create entities that have a predefined set of subtasks. On the people tab, we can link people to this project that have been created in the system. So let's go ahead and add the demo user that we made in the previous video by clicking on the add user icon in the name column. And then clicking on the check mark in the actions field. Let's go ahead and add that user to the animation team, something that we control at the project level, from the Teams tab, where we can define custom user groups. Now I've switched over to a blank project to illustrate creating some shots and assets. You'll see that this project is empty except for the shots and assets libraries. These get created automatically by loop and are the root level in the project hierarchy for those types of entities. Although it's not the only place in loop to do this from, we'll use the action menu for this demo. So we'll click on the Create Asset Action, which opens this drawer. We'll need to decide where in the project hierarchy to put this asset, which we can do by opening the Create In modal. Assets can either live on their own, or as children of other assets. We'll make a parent asset called Props, and then select it. Our new asset will be created as a child of the Props asset. We'll name this asset Lantern, give it a short code and assign it to us. We'll set the summary status to waiting to start, and you'll see that the detail status follows suit. We'll set the start date to November 30th, the end date in the future, the due date beyond that, and the percentage complete, zero. Then we'll click save and our asset gets created. The process is nearly identical for creating shots. We've seen list views in a couple of places already throughout the application, but let's take a look at some of the functionality that they provide. As you can see, they present data in a table format. We're looking at a list of tasks here, so let's try to sort the data. We go to the column header and click on it, and the column sorts ascending. Clicking on it again reverses the sort order, and clicking on it a third time removes the sort. Let's sort by due date again, 
and then go over to the name column and sort by that as well. You'll see that we now have two active sorts on this table. To group the data, another common table operation, all we have to do is grab a column header, drag it, and drop it into the space above the list. We can grab another column and do the same thing, creating a nested group. We can remove a grouping by clicking the X next to its field name. And we can change the sort order of groups by clicking on the field name. Columns can be rearranged by dragging and dropping them. And their visibility can be controlled by clicking on the three dots at the end of the header row and toggling fields on or off. If this is a configuration of the list view that we'll want to look at often, we can save it as a view. We'll go up to the Views menu, where you can see that we've already saved one view called Demo. We'll go down to the Save View button, give our new view a name, pick whether we want this view to be available system-wide or just for us, and click Save. You'll see that our new view appears in the top left, beside our existing view, and we can toggle between them. If we're looking for something specific in the table, either a specific entry or entries that share some common property, we can use filters. In the top right, open the filter menu and start by picking a field. We'll look for shots that are assigned to us. We'll use the operator exact and enter our username. Then we'll click apply to run the filter. You can see that all of the tasks returned match our username. Filters can also be saved to views, so let's do that by saving a new view, giving it a name, but this time let's save it as a user view so that it's only visible to us. You can see that it also appears in the left next to our other views, but it has a slightly different look to indicate that it isn't visible system-wide. Let's switch back to our starting view and talk about list view actions. If an item in a list view has any actions associated with its entity, they'll be available in the Actions column. Let's look for some shots. And take a look at the available actions. You'll see that we can open the Card Detail view, as well as the Modal Detail view. We'll take a look at the Card Detail view in the Kanban video. So let's open the Modal Detail here. You'll see that a new screen pops up on top of the list view, which gives a detailed overview of this task. On the left side, we have the latest media available to play. As well as an overview of important information. On the right, we have a breadcrumb trail showing where in the project hierarchy we are. And several tabs for associated items. The tasks tab will show a list of all tasks that are children of this task. The Versions tab will show changes made to this task in the Asset Manager. The Media tab will show playable media associated with this task. The Notes tab will show any notes on this task. And the Related tab will show any linked shots or assets if we're looking at the detail for one of those two entities. Closing the Detail view will return us back to where we were when we opened it. Now we're going to take a look at Loop's Media Review Tools. The first thing to do is load up a page that has media on it. This could be a project overview, a detail view, or in this case, the media data view. We'll start by making a new playlist. We'll click on the Playlist Manager from the action bar and click Create a Playlist. We'll give it a title and a description. And then we'll add some media to it. We can preview the media by scrubbing the thumbnail and add it to the playlist by dragging and dropping. This works anywhere in the app. Once we have some media on our playlist, we'll click Save and Play to start a review. With the review loaded, you can see the clips that we chose in the left underneath the video player, and you can see that we're the only active member of this review in the Members tab. If we share this link with some of our colleagues, they can join the review and we can collaborate in real time. Okay, so now my colleague has joined the review, and you can see that we're both active. If I go ahead and play, the first clip will reach its end, and the second clip will automatically begin. I pause, select the pen tool, and draw, my annotation will be visible to everyone in the session. Now let's make a note to accompany this drawing by switching to the Notes tab, 
we can enter a subject, and then some body text for the note. We can go ahead and post that, and it'll appear for all review members. You can see that someone else in the review just replied, and is now drawing with a blue pen. We can also create a task to make sure that this note gets addressed right from inside the review. Click on the Add Task button in the bottom of the note. Give the task a name. We'll assign it to ourselves. And click Create Task. All tasks created from a review this way are visible on the Tasks tab, including the Card Detail view, where we could schedule the task and change its status. Let's head back over to the video player to take a look at a few more of its controls. I can load individual clips by double-clicking on them. The active clip is indicated by a blue outline, and I can step forward through a clip with the frame forward button. I can toggle whether a clip will loop when it reaches its end, cycle through clips with the next clip button, and toggle on or off whether annotations are visible while playing. Just below the header, I can switch from seeing all notes and tasks in a review to only those on the active clip. Okay, and that's the basic overview of some of the, some of the core functionality. Um, we'll switch to a screen share here really quick and take a look at some of the more advanced features. Just give me one sec. I should be able to see my desktop now. And we're on the project landing page here. Um, same as we saw in the video, this is kind of a list of every project that uh, the logged in user can see. So um, we will take a look at the Kanban view first, which is kind of the core project management functionality um, in loop. We'll start by looking at the an empty project. Um, just to just to talk about the basics of, of what Kanban is for the benefit of anyone who, who isn't familiar with it. So you've probably seen um, something like Kanban uh, somewhere, um, Trello, Microsoft Planner, it's a bunch of popular applications that use it. It's pretty ubiquitous in software development. Um, it was actually invented to manage the assembly line process of making Toyota cars. Um, and, and really what it does is, is, is try to, you know, provide a visual representation of, of a process and, and how work items flow through it. So we found every, everyone that, that's kind of building loop that um, this is a methodology that works um, really well for, for the types of, of processes that you have on CG animated features and then some, you know, similar work um, where something starts uh, in, in, you know, a status like waiting progresses through you know, at least one or, or more steps and eventually is, is complete. Um, so we built that in as the core project management uh, feature in, in Loop. So we're on an, an empty board here. And if you think of this as a physical board, um, what we do um, for items of work that we need to complete is add cards to it. Um, we call the columns swim lanes. So you'll just you'll hear, hear me refer to those. Um, but what they represent is statuses of, of, you know, the individual work items. So Loops Kanban um, introduces a few kind of new features to, to that, um, that project management idea where there's different types of cards for, for different types of work. And you'll see in a second that um, there's actually multiple Kanban boards within, within this one. So let's just take a look at, at the, different, the different types of cards you can make. This project, um, is configured pretty basically, and you you can set this up, you know, to suit your, your workflow if you need to, or you can use one of our templates um, that you saw in the project management video. But um, in the asset library, I can create a process, a task, or an entity. So those are the three the three types of cards that I can make at this level here, and we can make one of each just to um, show what they look like and how they work. So process. 
and a task. Okay, so um, three types of cards. Processes um, are kind of groups of tasks. So in CG animation, we have processes like rigging, modeling, um, you know, animation, rendering, and things like that. A task is kind of the smallest unit of work. That's that's you know something that gets assigned to a specific user to to complete. You know, if you were in the animation process, that might be a blocking animation pass. Uh, then you have, might have another task inside that process for a final animation pass. Um, and then an asset is kind of a higher level construct that kind of represents the you know the complete um, piece of work that uh, the processes and tasks will will result in. So you probably uh, at this level of the board would only want to have assets. And then what loop lets you do is kind of drill down through um, cards that are allowed to have other cards as children uh, into a, a separate board for, for those. So you can see that the asset card and the process card both have this kind of three-dimensional um, outline that kind of indicates that uh, there's another board behind that card. So uh, the task doesn't have that. It's the smallest unit of work that, that you know, it has no no subtasks, no, no children. So um, if we were to go into the this asset that we made, for example, you'll see that we end up um, in this breadcrumb trail in a um, another level of, of the Kanban board. And so this asset can have its own um, statuses and its own cards associated with with the work that goes into, into making it. So here is probably where you'd want to make something like a process called uh, modeling if this was an asset. <laughs> And inside of that modeling process, you probably want to make some tasks. Or high risk, low risk, you know, whatever your workflow is. So now you see we're three levels deep in this Kanban board. On the modeling board, it has two tasks. And as we, you know, progress through um, the work, we kind of move these through the, through the swim lanes and when everything here is done, we go up a level and, you know, that whole process would be, would become done. And eventually when all of our processes are done, that whole asset would be done. And at every level of the, of the board, you can kind of set up your own statuses. This is a very simple example. Uh, I'll show you a more complex one in a second from a, from a kind of live production. But um, this way of managing tasks and, and work kind of lets you um, get a good visual. Like the great thing about Kanban is that you get a good visual representation of where where all your tasks and 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 things are are backing up, or you know where you might have some some roadblocks. Um, and you'll see we have a couple other views to help to help simplify that, which I'll I'll show you on the other board. But that's that's kind of the basics. Um, you know, there's a lot of great resources to learn more about about you know utilizing Kanban in, in project management. But um, that's that's how Loops works. It's it's the this this idea of, of different types of cards for for different things and then subtasks of cards that let you kind of drill down to manage multiple processes in one in one um, kind of central place. Um, I think I mentioned that there's there's two there's two kind of root levels to the Kanban board. We're in the asset library. Um, there's also a shot library. Um, so you, you're, you know, those two respective areas of work um, each have a, a starting point in the board, and you can navigate um, via these breadcrumbs. If we just switch over really quick to um, this is a board from a from a production that actually has some some work happening on it. So you can see we're in the shot library here, and uh, we have our sequences available here we can switch between them from from the breadcrumb trail but we have a couple of you know more um advanced statuses here to represent where these shots are in the process they obviously start at uh in waiting and, and work their way through to approved or could be better in this case um and if we you know drill down into them uh, you'll see that we have a different set of statuses on at the shot level that uh, sorry that's something's taking let's see that we have a different type a different set of statuses at the shot level so the nested kanban view lets you um 
lets you have different teams manage different processes at different levels in kind of the way that they that they want to. Um, and in that way, you can you, you can kind of let individual departments work as they see fit, but still get an overall picture of, um, of where you're at. So that brings us to kind of the next point, which is that if everyone's working with their own statuses on the board, um, you know, how can we how can we get a, a look at what um, you know, what the what the overall general state of the production is. And we introduced this concept of, of, a, of a second level of statuses. So we have what we're looking at here are what Luke refers to as detail statuses. And that's kind of the process project specific um, stuff that that you, you, you know, you would use to, to manage your shots, your, you know, the rigging team might have its own set of, you know, statuses it wants to work with. Um, the assets themselves, you know, have different statuses than the shots, things like that. But uh, at some point, you, you kind of want to consolidate all of that. And especially across projects, you want to consolidate um, all of that into a, a, a much more simple group of, of statuses um, to get a, a higher level view of, of where, where a project is at. So um, every detail status you can set up to, to map to a, a summary status is what we call it. And, and that's kind of a higher level thing that you set up at the company level, uh, but you can view it in the project level. Um, where things like waiting to start and ready to start, that's that's an important distinction uh, here at the shot level, but um, not so much at the at you know at a, at a higher level. Um, if you're the producer or you know the, an executive and you're trying to, to look at this project and see where it's at, um, these can effectively mean the same thing. Um, the shot hasn't really begun yet. So what we do is we say the detail status waiting to start maps to the summary status waiting to start and the detail status ready to start maps to the summary status ready to start. And you probably do the same thing for approved and CVB. You might do the same thing for hold and out of picture. So you get this much, much simpler um, list of statuses. And the Kanban board, uh, you can see up in the top right here, defaults to the, to the detail statuses, but you can actually flip it to um, the summary statuses and you'll get a Kind of condensed view, so all the all the shots that um, are in detail statuses that map to waiting to start show here, and you get a you know a, a clearer picture of where where you might have some some bigger picture backlogs and, and bottlenecks. And we have a third view called user view, where the the tasks get um, grouped by the user they're assigned to. This is not so much a um, a Kanban workflow, as in things would move from left to right through the swim lanes, but it does it does give you another kind of perspective on who might have um, too much work. Um, just another another way to spot uh, bottlenecks and, and, and things like that. But the detail view is kind of the main the main Kanban view that you'll probably work with with the most. Um, but yeah, you do have that option for for some some different looks at at your data. And that's. If you have any questions about the, about the Kanban board specifically, if you just just put them in the Q and A, and we'll we'll circle back to them. But I think we have yeah, one, think, Mike. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me, I can pull it up. Our friend Ratchet from uh, Atomic is asking: um, When making a new asset, are we able to assign a template so that any new asset would get the same list of processes and tasks created for it? So can we yeah, yeah, definitely. That's uh, that's a good question, and we'll just talk about that. So. Yeah, in your project settings, actually, let's go to the MT project. In your project settings, you can set up um, templates here on this tab. So you'll see we have a couple set up here already. Let's look at um, asset, for example. So um, yeah, sorry, maybe Mimo is a better example. Yeah, when you, when you create an asset, um, the wrong tab, that's why. When you create an asset, we have this asset template. So this is this is kind of the template of, of things that will get made anytime that you make um, an asset or, or anytime you make anything that this template is applied to. So in the types here, these, these are kind of the entities um, that make up the, the Kanban board. They represent the different types of um, card you can make. 
And then the task templates are the, the things that get created automatically when you do that. So in our asset template, you'll see that anytime we make an asset, we get a modeling in art, a rigging of the effects and a surfacing process. And um, those themselves have, have um, you know, a modeling design task, a reference task, a baseline rig task, a VFX task, and a surfacing design task. And you can keep going as, as, you know, as far, far down as you want for different processes and tasks and sub entities and, and things. So yes, you can, you can set that up. And when you, make, uh, when you make something on the Kanban board or through the action menu, these things will automatically get, um, get populated. Uh, so let's take a look at the asset manager, which is kind of a second um, major feature of, of Loop. We'll look at the Blender asset manager, um, but we are also shipping with a Maya, a Maya asset manager that has the same functionality. And when you set up your project, you can pick which of the um, which of the two uh, file types you you you're going to be working with. So just really quick, um, actually, John, I'm going to go ahead and share it. There's just like a minute and a half video of, of, of a quick um, example using the, using the Blender Asset Manager. And then I'll show you some of the more detailed um, settings yep. and, and options uh, right after. If you guys can bear with one more video. Uh, it's just it uses some bit some more complex assets um, that are a little bit slower to work with live. So let me just pull that up. While you're pulling that up, Mike, I just wanted to mention too that uh, this first version of Loop will ship with plugins for Maya and Blender, but in, in the near future, we're also looking at creating plugins and support for Houdini as well as Unreal Engine, and our intention is to support all of the major packages out there. Yeah, and I'll touch on that again um, after. Okay, so let me just share this video. Play. Like I said, it's pretty quick and then we'll, we'll jump into it um, in a demo. Okay, this is going to be a very quick look at the Loop Asset Manager add-on for Blender. We work with the Asset Manager from the Tool and Workspace tab. For this demo, we'll be working on Scene 10, Shot 10, so we'll switch to the Shots library. Open Scene 10, and then select Shot 10. We'll switch to the Layout team and make sure that we have the latest working file selected. In this case, that's the version one that Loop has automatically created for us. And then we'll click open. The asset manager has checked out version one of the layout file, so we can go back to the asset browser and open the asset library. We'll start by bringing in our alley set. So we'll open the sets container, switch to the surfacing team, and bring in the latest published file. We'll do the same for our barrel asset. Then we'll go ahead and make some modifications to the layout. And once we're happy with it, save and publish for a downstream team to pick up. Okay, that's it. So that's just a quick, a quick um, demo. That's uh, a bit faster to do in a video than live. But um, let me share my screen again, and we'll take a look at some of the um, more specific features. So... All right, so we'll use this example project for, for this. You'll see that the asset manager kind of mirrors the same project structure that you get on the, um, on the Kanban here. So on, in this project, I have uh, in my asset library, just an asset called example one. And if I switch over to Blender, um, I've already installed the add-on. There's a Windows installer uh, that makes it pretty straightforward. So it's already, it's ready to go. If I just go to my add-ons tab, my preferences, you can see that I have it enabled here. Um, all you have to do is point it to your, your loop instance, uh, log in. And that's really, yeah, you're ready to get going. Just need to pick a project. We're gonna work out of the example project. Um, 
a network mode. This um, so the asset manager supports two ways of working. One is cloud, which is kind of for remote um, work. So all, everything the asset manager kind of tracks and manages uh, is is stored in AWS. Um, and if I'm if I'm working in cloud mode. Um, Anytime I check something out, it'll pull down all the assets and, and files that it needs um, to my local C drive temp directory, which you can configure here. Um, if I'm working in local network mode, that, that's kind of a thing we support, just advanced configuration for it, where if you're working out of a studio, um, as, as things get pushed to AWS, they'll get kind of um, localized to um, a, a studio location. So you can, you can have a bunch of things on shared storage rather than every individual user having to download everything to their machine. If you, if you, if you have a shared storage set up, um, that can automatically kind of, kind of pull everything down from AWS. And uh, instead, of, instead of downloading individual files every time, it, uh, the asset manager will go and look for that stuff um, here, depending on um, how I've configured it. So I'm working at home, uh, I'm working in cloud mode, and it's going to pull things down to my C drive temp folder. Um, for me to work with locally until it pushes them back um, to the cloud. So we can close that, we're good to go. Uh, we just get to go over to the active tool and workspace settings over here and uh, the loop add-on shows up uh, over here. You can see we're still logged in. And we're in the example project that we loaded up. You can see we're in the assets library uh, by default and uh, I have my example asset here. So actually, let me just go ahead and make this. UI a little bigger for you guys. Okay, so a couple of things in the asset manager. Um, we work with this concept of teams. These are uh, these are actually the processes uh, that that are created underneath underneath my asset. So uh, we had a question earlier um, about templates. When I made this asset, these these four things automatically got created: my art modeling, surfacing, and rigging. Um, processes, and that's what we see here in the in the team dropdown. So you got to pick where you're working from first. Um, every team gets a gets their own kind of sandbox to work from. That's that's file specific to this to, to this team. Uh, this is a fresh asset, so there's no work done here yet. But you can see that everyone gets a version one file, which is the just a stub file um, that's set up for for asset tracking. So if we were going to start. Uh, we'll jump right to surfacing, for example. Uh, so we're in the surfacing sandbox here. This is the, the version one file that loop automatically creates. Um, to get going, all we got to do is open it. You'll see quick that uh, the asset manager will pull that down. And now we're in, uh, I think you guys can see this. We're in the example one.v1.checkout.blend file. So this is the tracked file that um, loop made for us. Just go back to the asset manager. It pulled me a new file, so it switched to the UI. Um, now we're ready to, to get going. So if we make some changes here, we don't need any of this stuff. Maybe I'll just uh, I'll just append in my circle. So this is the marketing asset. Okay, so if we have our asset. Um, surfaced and ready to go. Um, you know, we've done whatever we're going to do to it. Uh, we can save a version and that will, that will um, push it back to, back to the, uh, back to the cloud. So we're working locally right now. I can save and, you know, work on my file locally doing whatever I, whatever I need to do normal Blender workflow. Um, and as soon as I'm ready to, to save my work back to the cloud, so it's the end of the day and I'm, you know, maybe I'm, I'm not done this yet, but it's time to check it in. I'm going to hit save. Uh, I'm going to get this little dialogue. I'm going to add some comments. Um, well, in a real workflow, I'd probably pull that model in from the modeling team, but um, do it like this for now. And then I have this option to sync external files. That's anything outside of the blend file. That's not um, that's not kind of contained uh, textures or you know anything you're working with. That's not there. So I don't need to do that here. You might want to do that. That that's uh, turned on automatically for when we publish in a second. So you don't need to worry too much. But um, 
if you wanted to do it for your sandbox publish, you can control that here. We'll leave it off, click OK. You'll see that the asset manager versions this up. We get a V2 and it uploads that to AWS. It's a pretty small file, so it goes pretty quick. And now we have this version two that's a surface circle. And if we decide that this is actually ready to, to pass on to a downstream team uh, or you know ready, ready to be used in shots, uh, what we do is similar, except we do the save and publish. So every team um, supports this idea of having like a canonical version that that other teams can pick up from them. Uh, in this case, we haven't set one yet, but that's what we, what we refer to as the published. So if we flip to the publish tab from the sandbox, there's no published files yet for the surfacing team. Um, so to make one, pretty much the same process as saving, um, we get the same dialog. And just going to take a comment again. Hit OK. There's no option to sync files here because it does it automatically uh, for publishes to make sure that everything is there. It makes it version three. It uploads to AWS and it's good to go. You can see it has this publish indicator uh, icon on the right here. And if we go to the publish area, you'll see that version three is the published file. So if we were going to make a shot, let me just pretend that we started Blender here. So we go back to the asset manager and we go to the shots library. We're gonna you know, make our shots by using the assets on this project. In the shots library, I have the sequence, sequence one. I go in there and write shot 10 and we'll work out a shot 10. So same as we saw with the assets, except I have a different set of teams for my shots, obviously. Um, if I wanted to work on the effects team, I'd pick that. I'd open the effects team's kind of version one um, stub file. And now I'm in that um, effects file. So ready to start working. And you'll see down here, there's a couple of, um, extra pieces of metadata that uh, files tracked with loop carry with them, team, um, path structure, um, user, and um, version. So what we want to do probably is import um, an asset. So we can do that uh, a couple of ways. But we flip back to the assets library, we'll go to the example one, uh, asset that we were building earlier. Um, oops. Let's go over there. Hmm. It's weird. We should see our. We should see our assets there. Uh, I'll check that in one sec, but. We can just bring in a circle from their V1 asset. So um, let me let me really quickly do something here. Let me go to the assets, go to the example one, open this. Oh, I'm sorry, I see. I see my hand is done. Uh, okay, that was just me being silly. So we need to go, let's go back to our shots. Back to shot 10. Uh, let's go back to the effects team. Let's open V1. Back where we were. Yeah, you gotta be careful when you're when you're looking around in here to make sure you're looking at the right team. So what I wasn't seeing, if I go back to assets, uh, back to example one is that we were working under the surfacing team. So I want to pick up actually the latest surfaced asset, uh, which you'll see here in the asset manager. And you can you can open that file if you want, um, but we'll actually We'll just uh, link or append that in. So you have this option down here as though you were importing it from any other uh, blend file. Um, so let's hang in there. I'll just append it. And that comes in from the from the surfacing team um, into my SHA-10 file. So now we've got our asset in here ready to go. We can do whatever work we're going to do. Um, 
Vexim for demonstration purposes. There we go. Once we're happy with that, we'll go back to the asset manager and we should flip back to the shot that we're working from actually. And we're going to save this back to the cloud. Maybe we'll go ahead and just save and publish it. We'll say that's ready, ready for lighting to pick up and render. Do a save and publish. Um, enter a comment, hit OK. And you'll see that this gets uploaded to the cloud, same as the same as the um, asset we were working with. So that's that's basically how you work with the asset manager, and the functionality is is pretty much the same in Maya. Um, it's 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 pretty simple from a user interface perspective. On the back end, it does some intelligent things, like um, it won't transfer files that already exist in the cloud. Obviously, with small things like like this, it's not a big deal. But when you get into big textures and things, um, it'll it'll you know pull them down to your local workstation, but it won't send them back every time um, if it sees that they're already in your S3 storage. Um, so it kind of minimizes the amount of data going back and forth to the extent that it can. Um, yeah, it's a it's a pretty powerful version control system. And if we go back to loop really quick, um, we should be able to see in the transit status here, all the changes that I made, um, things going back and forth. So you get a quick look um, at, uh, you know, what's going where and who's working on what from here. And that's, that's, pretty, much, that's pretty much it. I'm just mindful of the time here um, coming up on the hour. So if anyone has any specific questions, we can, um, we can take a look. Let me just pull up the Q and A. Yeah, I think we're. I think we've answered a lot of them in line. Okay, great. Um, if anybody else has questions that they want to pose, now is a now is a great time to do that. There's a few things um, that we you know we haven't gotten into in detail, like reporting and analytics, rendering things like that, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have there. I can share really quick, John, actually, just um, I can highlight just the, the core feature that makes reporting really, really easy and, and okay. powerful. Yeah. Um, so you'll see in probably a lot of our um, uh, marketing stuff that there's a, there's a re some reporting functionality. And the way we built this out is, sorry, I'm just going to show my screen again here, is around this idea. So. Um, I don't think I mentioned this, but my background is is um, actually in production. I'm a, just a 3D hobbyist, um, but I, I was a VFX producer for for many years. And um, one of the things that I, that I think is pretty cool about Loop is that uh, you kind of get this live link to the data that's that's in there. Uh, so it's definitely on our roadmap to build in some some um, reporting features in, inside the application, some some you know live charts and things, but. Um, You'll even see that we have it kind of stubbed out, but disabled here at the bottom of the uh, of the menu. Um, what we do have, though, uh, that's that's pretty cool. Is um, you, in some packages, I'm sure you're you're you've seen that you have to export your data um, into a CSV and then bring that into your reports. Um, and I've spent many years with thousands of CSVs floating around my desktop. And what Loop kind of lets you do that's that's interesting is in Excel, in Power BI, in whatever you're using for, for your reporting, you probably have existing reports already. Um, you can kind of hook them up to, to, the, actual, to the actual data inside of Loop. So uh, you do that just by pulling in data in Excel. I'm in Excel here from other sources, from an OData feed, and this is a live connection um, to your Loop instance. Uh, and then you just need to grab your URL, put it in here. You actually need to, this is in the docs, specify the port and the OData uh, endpoint. And 
you'll get this navigator and what you'll you'll actually be asked to log in i've already logged in on this machine so um, you'll just need to enter your username and, and password uh, and what you get here is um, all the database tables that that kind of make up the back end of loop and you can connect to them in excel so if you wanted to grab your shots and tasks and projects um, you could bring those in. So probably we'll get shots, tasks, and uh, uh, projects. You can load those right into Excel. Uh, you can load them into Power Query and do some, some pretty advanced um, transformations and manipulations of the data. We actually recommend you do that for some, some bigger tables uh, just to, to make the, uh, the queries a little bit quicker. Um, and yeah, you can, you can build some, some, some pretty complex reports this way. It's as easy as coming back into Excel and hitting refresh to, to pull in fresh data. Um, that's kind of the basics of it. Uh, if you, if you do sign up and you're reading the docs, um, there's, there's a walkthrough to, to get going and we hope to kind of have some more examples come out in the next couple of weeks, um, just on how to, how to use this for different types of reporting and in different applications, but the Excel walkthrough is there uh for for anyone who, who's curious yeah a question came in as well mike regarding the plugin plugin language being python or c and uh when will our api and sdk be available so it's uh, it's python uh it's it's available now so if you if you get the the windows installer um and you and you set everything up it'll actually install the api on your on your machine uh for you uh, in the next, I think sometime next week, we're actually we're, we're gonna we'll make the the repository public for the for the uh, API code itself, though, um, so you can pull that down outside of the installer. But um, for now, yeah, you get access to it just by installing. Yeah. Um, once you sign up, so it's uh, it's there. We're we're there's you know there's a couple there's some examples and, and some code samples in the docs. We're hoping to again release a bunch more um, of those over the next coming weeks and months so that um, it becomes a bit more clear how to use that. But uh, yeah, that's that's all available now. Uh, the, the asset manager yep. itself is, is, is built on the um, publicly available client APIs. So that code too will be available eventually. You can kind of rip that apart and, and see how see how it works, um, even augment it if you want. So yeah, there's a, there's a plan to get all that out there. Uh, but but for now, the, the way to access the API is um, is uh, with the client installer, the loop suite installer. Yep. And sort of being open with our API and um, and the plugin language and all that is it fits into what I was saying earlier about wanting to really be for artists and for the community and support people developing on top of this and all those sorts of things. Um, I'll just mention really quickly, the other thing that we, we didn't really go through and we're running out of time, so I want to be mindful of that, is um, our partnership with AWS Thinkbox for Deadline. So um, in our business, you know, the word cloud sometimes scares people, sometimes excites people, and, and Loop is a cloud-based tool for sure, but we really want to provide sort of an elegant transition to the cloud. So um, we can provide you with Deadline licenses to use for all of your on-prem resources. Uh, as well as being sort of that platform to launch renders into the cloud as well. So we respect that people have got a significant in investment in technology at home or in your studio, and we don't expect you to just throw that out, but we know that people are always looking for readily available, scalable, extensible resources on the cloud for render and storage. And, and so we really want to uh, enable that as well. So we really consider ourselves to be a, a, a gentle transition to the cloud. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention in terms of the plugins that we're going to be supporting or, or um, types of technology that we're going to be supporting is USD as well. Um, so we plan to have full USD support coming shortly. I'm just seeing a quick question coming up here. Um, oh, you got it, Mike? Okay. Yeah, I got it. So yeah, at just the maybe, moment, just maybe read the, at the question. Moment, so in case. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> So the, the, the question is um, for the asset manager, how do you handle assets being worked on in, in multiple DCCs? And at the moment, okay, so there's the, the short answer is it, it's, it's, it's built at the moment to work out of one DCC. So everything in Blender or everything in Maya, but um, the back end is kind of there uh, to, to support um, other types of files. So how we expose that is, is 
in progress at the moment. Um, we do expect to have that uh, at some point. I think John, we're just working out the future, the future yep. roadmap. So we'll we'll be able to to disclose our plans uh, for the the next couple of yep. months soon. But um, yeah, I, for now, you, you'd probably have to export um, Alembic or or something, and and work with um, external files. Um, so yeah, the, the the back end is in place. You see in the API that that there is there is the ability to track um, things other than Maya or Blender files. But um, yeah, at, at the moment uh, it's it's one or the other. Yeah, and the other thing that I would say it's in inside of an hour. It's really we can only really scratch the surface of everything that Loop is all about and and its capabilities. But what I would really like to come yeah. out of this is if everybody everybody who's on this webinar has got my email address, please contact me directly. We would be happy to set up one on one um, discussions and demos with you all. We really want to learn about your artistic needs and your studio needs. And um, we're really interested in your feedback on Loop as well. We, you know, we think that we've got something pretty great here, but we also understand that it, there's directions that we can go that that might be better for, you know, different sub industries like 2D, 3D games, design, what have you. So we really want to consider your feedback and and um, understand what's important for you from a development standpoint. So I, and on that specific question, John, sorry, just. Um... It, it is something that uh, our sister company, Tangent Animation, uh, is doing with the Asset Manager, and, and we've kind of supported developing that. So we can definitely put you in touch with with people that have that have built out yeah. that um, that kind of functionality um, in terms of what what they're doing with it. But um, yep, yeah, it's uh, it's probably beyond the scope of what I can cover in two yeah. minutes. Um, so with that in mind too, and I'm happy to connect you with Mike and some of the technologists behind Loop as well. And I would mention, keep an eye on Twitter because I believe next week, if it's on Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to be doing a Ask Me Almost Anything, we call it, with Jeff Bell, um, who is our, our CEO and founder and, and one of the main brains behind Loop. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, Julie's just telling me it is Thursday, so that's great. Um, so if we don't have any more questions, again, we just want to be respectful of time. Please keep the questions coming to me via email or reach out to us on any of our social platforms, and we'd be happy to connect with you and invite us to set up a meeting with you and understand what your needs are and any concerns that you have and how Loop might be able to help with that. Um, so thanks everybody, please stay safe. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And uh, we're really excited to, uh, to be speaking with you and have Loop out in the market. Thanks Mike, thanks for everybody on our team and we'll talk to everybody soon. Take it easy. Thanks everyone.